Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? Our first story this week marks the continuing body of evidence that reinfections will occur with the CCP virus. Now we have at least four countries. Hong Kong, Belgium, Netherlands and America. This last case being the American one. What marks this reinfection as distinct from the three others is that this reinfection was both in a young person and a severe case of reinfection. This means that, unlike the others, who were either old and had relatively diminished symptoms, or were young and had minimal symptoms, this young person should have been able to resist the virus more effectively. The fact that their second infection was considered serious would indicate that either their body failed to develop an immune response, or the virus is getting to a point where it's infecting people in a way that's more aggressive. This is still not the general trend, and so, while concerning, should not be something that immediately preys on everyone's imagination. This all owes to how vulnerable viruses are in general to mutations. In the two times that he was diagnosed with the CCP virus, the 25-year-old American had slightly different versions of the CCP virus. Now, viruses in general mutate rapidly over time because they're not exactly able to control their DNA. What we are expecting to see, but have not observed, is a wholesale change of the genome to make it that much more aggressive on the whole. These four individual infections might, by themselves, prove to be something important, but they're very limited in scope. The concern with any kind of change in the CCP virus is that it may lead to more reinfections on a much larger scale, bringing us back to where we're trying to get away from at the moment. That means we need treatments, and at least one more treatment has been added to the list of possible options. What is important about this medication is not so much the fact that it is able to treat the CCP virus, but how much so and the fact that it is already readily available. It is a relatively readily available, safe and well used medication known as a hydrocortisone. It's often used for patients who are on ventilators to improve their longevity and survivability while on these. It helps with some of the inflammation associated with it. As we've mentioned previously, one of the issues with the CCP virus is the fact that it causes almost systemic inflammation. This means inflammation across the entire body, which can be quite difficult to deal with. What's important to note here is that these are not prophylactic medications. They are treatments for when you are infected, and they should be administered and prescribed by someone who knows what they're doing. In other words, we still have no way of stopping the CCP virus, and this newest treatment option is only going to help us if someone is infected by it. Many of the best efforts to prevent the spread of the CCP virus involve using face shields and masks. One study recently looked at the benefits of using either visors or face masks with valves. What's important in this study was that these both had serious issues with their design and created problems. Now, some people choose to use them for a variety of reasons. Mostly they're ergonomic. The comfort of wearing a face shield is significantly higher than wearing a mask, but the face shield itself doesn't provide the same degree of protection. The face mask with valves helps with some of the breathing related stuff, it prevents them from getting as hot and uncomfortable. What the study found was that in both cases, it could create problems. Face shields could act as a way of basically concentrating the stream of things that are coming out of your mouth and nose. This could include viral particles, and they would go around the face shield. In the case of the face mask with valves, it basically acted as a way to concentrate and propel the aerosolized droplets out of those valves. Strangely enough, the more basic cotton face mask is actually more effective than using either the valved face mask or a visor. This is because the cotton acts as a sort of baffle, preventing as much movement of air, droplets, and consequently viral particles. The way the researchers tested this seems to be the favourite method at the minute, involving lasers, light, and some sort of analogue of the droplets. In this case, a mannequin's head and vapour coming out of a fog machine. Using that in combination with a laser allowed them to more or less shine a light on all of the droplets, 
which allowed them to be visualized. This could then be analyzed for its movement. They did that by using mathematics, modeling, and a few other activities to figure out which masks provided a benefit and whether or not they had defects that would become a problem later on. In line with who is and isn't being infected and why, we should look at some clarification being brought out by one of the doctors from the Penn State University. What they've said recently and had to be retrospectively clarified was that about 1 in 10 of their athletes had been infected with the CCP virus and it had caused myocarditis. This is inflammation of the heart through an infection. What it turns out to be is that this information had been passed on verbally and without a lot of clarification for the guy who then passed it on again. Effectively, a game of Chinese whispers. What this then led to was the clarification that the rate wasn't 1 in 10, it was close to 15%, but that those students who had been infected by the CCP virus, for the most part, were not symptomatic, or at least they weren't particularly symptomatic. On top of this though, there were 30-35% to 35 of the heart muscles of those who were infected that had become inflamed. This has led to a lot of confusion, both within the university and to within most of the universities involved decision on what to do with these sporting activities. How do you safely implement a physical contact sport in a situation where getting close to other people shouldn't be happening? You don't have masks that are necessarily reliable. And ultimately, if someone becomes infected, just who's responsible for the fallout? This led the Big Ten to announce it would postpone the fall sports season on August 11th, and at this stage it's indefinite. Hopefully the news from America with the FDA approving a CCP virus vaccine that it might come back sooner rather than later. The catch to this is that the vaccine itself hasn't completed its trials. Now that's a big concern to say the least. Any drug being given preliminary approval, and that hasn't happened yet, before its trials are completed, shouldn't be trusted in general. Now, they may go with an emergency approval protocol, and that means the drug would be approved for a graduated rollout in very limited capacity, but these are extraordinary and unusual, even by the standards of the CCP virus outbreak. Now, there have been some conspiracy theories about the date that's been proposed for this initial rollout of any vaccine that has been given emergency approvals, that date being around November 3rd which is near to the US election time. This means some people are arguing that the current White House administration is pushing for an early release to prop up and support the current president's position. Others are arguing that it's simply random chance. We don't have enough details on just how that date has been reached, but the date is less important in the overall context of things than what needs to happen before then. There are several major hurdles to having that date in particular. The first and foremost is having the infrastructure and logistics available to deploy vaccines on a large scale. Secondary to that, and perhaps somewhat more important, but theoretically possible, is having enough vaccine in the roughly two months to go. That is two months to create however many doses of the vaccine are needed for that initial approval even when phase 3 clinical trials have not been finalized. One of the ongoing concerns other than getting a vaccine for the CCP virus is just who is at risk and most affected. Some figures are indisputable, for example, men being more affected than women. What is less certain has been, are children just as vulnerable as adults, and how much are they going to be infected and how likely are they to infect others? It's one of the things that sat somewhere between the degree of unsurety about children and definitive proof with males versus females is whether or not diseases in particular, lupus and arthritis, would have on the mortality and severity of infection by the CCP virus. We've understood to an approximate degree that any comorbidity is likely to increase the rate of mortality for someone infected. It's also likely to increase the risk that they are. Of being hospitalized from the CCP virus. The study found that for the most part lupus and arthritis did not have a contributing effect. 
this is useful to know about. At least in the case of arthritis and lupus, it's an immunologically oriented disease, which means the immune system plays a major part in it, or the medications used affect the immune system. In the case of arthritis, this is particularly true. If the patients were on a steroid medication for their arthritis, then they may have had an increased risk of needing hospital care. But otherwise, if they were taking the more standard and normal medications for arthritis, then their chances were just the same as anyone else. In this case, they were taking a drug related to one of the drugs we mentioned earlier. It's a corticoid steroid type of drug. In this case, glucocorticoid. They work by suppressing the immune system, and it would stand to reason that if you were taking them before you were infected by the CCP virus, you have artificially deflated your immune system, thereby handicapping it. If you take it after you have been infected in an effort to dampen the response, it may take you longer to resist the virus, but you will have an active immune system. If you can focus the initial action of the corticoid steroids, if you are taking them as a gas or similar inhalant, you can focus it on the areas where you need to be most concerned about the activity. For example, opening the airways by removing the inflammation in that area, thereby allowing the patient to breathe freely. This will help them in their recovery, but overall it won't handicap the immune system as severely as a systemic, non-targeted dose of medication like an arthritis patient would be taking in order to affect all of their joints. Thankfully, that's the last of the news we have about the CCP virus this week. What we have instead is interesting studies about honeybee venom and cancer cells. Although these studies are all based in a petri dish, and the same argument as for petri dishes applies to test tubes, the results are still interesting enough to be mentioned. Bees carry a small amount of venom which they inject with their stinger. If you've ever had the unpleasant experience of being stung by a bee, you may have noticed that the removed stinger continues to pulse, even after the bee's flown off. This pulsing motion is when it's still injecting venom into you, and one reason why the bee dies. That venom itself is an interesting compound, and... Research has been looking at whether or not it could be useful in a variety of ways. In this case, whether or not it has an effect on breast cancer. One reason why it's such an interesting study is that it affected the cancer cell lines they were testing, particularly the breast cancer cell lines, but it had no effect on normal cells. This means that unlike other medications we use to treat cancer cells at the moment, it could be far more targeted. This made the cells far more vulnerable to regular chemotherapy drugs, which means you could use significantly less chemotherapy drugs in order to affect them. It would also improve the activity of the immune system by suppressing some of the mechanisms it uses to evade detection by the immune system. This study fits neatly into the next story we have as well, which is something about why we should be taking studies like those in the honeybee venom with a grain of salt. That is, only 10% of medical treatments are backed by a body of high quality evidence. This means 10% of the treatments a doctor may advise or prescribe may not be as effective as they should be, and they may not even have the backing to be prescribed the way they have been. The systemic analyses looked at 154 Cochrane systemic reviews. These are from the last five years. Of these, 15 had high quality evidence. That is what you really want to have if you are going to use the evidence behind that particular treatment as an argument as to why it's working, how it works, and the fact it should continue to be used. 37% had moderate evidence. 31% had low, 22% had very low evidence quality. Cochrane reviews are considered among some of the best because of how rigorously they are done. Not only that, but they have a well-established method of figuring out just how reliable the evidence within the studies is. This means that when they come to a conclusion, they not only tell you how they got to that conclusion, but they explain how each study within it either gives good or bad points 
and where those good and bad points lie within it. While yes, the Cochrane grade system is flawed, it's pretty much the best tool we currently have available because it is consistent, reliable, and easily extrapolated to other approaches. One thing it doesn't lend itself well to are case studies, and here we have one for you about a teenager who swallowed a sewing pin, had it pierce his heart, and wasn't aware until it started causing problems. We can't say that we're disappointed that the teen would try and DIY tailoring his own clothes, but even so, for a 17-year-old, he may have been too careless. It begins with him presenting to the emergency room with back pain, and that would become worse when he was lying down or breathing deeply. He was, of course, given an EKG, given that this is one of the obvious signs of a heart attack. The results of this EKG were abnormal. This means that there is a problem with his heart. Given his age and all the other circumstances, the obvious issue is probably going to be some sort of myocarditis. Inflammation of the heart. We've mentioned just earlier an example of this. But there are others. What then happened was testing to see whether or not he was having a heart attack. What they found was that this wasn't exactly the case. He did have increased levels of proteins, but that was only an indication of heart injury, but not the kind of heart injury they were expecting. They then sent him for a CT scan. This would tell them if the heart was behaving abnormally, beating in places where it shouldn't be beating, or not beating in places where it should be. What they found instead was a foreign metal object, a short piece of metal, about three and a half centimeters long and straight, but it was poking out of his heart's right ventricle. That's not where these things should be. Generally speaking, the body doesn't have any foreign metal objects in it, unless you're elderly and have prosthetics, or have had broken legs, broken arms, in fact any broken bone. That argument may not work so well now that we think about it, but there shouldn't be any metal objects inside the heart itself. In this case, somehow or other he had ingested a sewing needle or pin when he had been tailoring his clothes. The problem with this is the only way to get that pin out was open heart surgery. That would involve cracking open his rib cage, finding his heart, finding the small sharp metal pin and removing it. Fortunately, he was able to recover without any particular complications. While talking about finding unknown things, Russia's just declassified footage of the Saar bomber. That name may sound slightly familiar to you. Somewhere in the back of your mind, you might have heard something about it. If nothing else, you should know at least a little bit about its history. It's one of the reasons why America developed Bikini Atoll as a nuclear test site. The Saar bomber, otherwise known as RDS-220, is a massive atomic weapon. Despite being detonated more than 4 kilometers above ground, it completely stripped the island it was being tested on bare. You could see it from nearly a thousand kilometers away and feel the heat from it 250 kilometers away. The mushroom cloud it generated got to a point where it just barely did not touch the edge of space. Consider that. The explosives, the nuclear bomb the Russians dropped, was so powerful, even in 1961, that all these features were apparent. This is one of the big reasons why they've kept it secret. After all, you don't want the world knowing just how dangerous the weapons you hold are, especially if you're in the middle of a cold war. We spoke about some of the explosive payloads that were within the Bikini Atoll tests. These were all mostly below 25 kilotons. The Saar bomber was equivalent to 45 million metric tons of TNT. Although admittedly, that is only half of what the then premier of the USSR wanted. Even so, this is a massive bomb and dwarfs just about any other thing being detonated on Earth to date. And in fact, it is the largest explosion on Earth to date. Our final piece of news this week is less of a breakthrough in atomic weapons and more breakthrough in energy. 
It's an artificial photosynthesis method that allows the storage of energy and then using it as fuel. Plants use photosynthesis as a way to generate energy. This allows them to then produce all the necessities for their life. We've long tried to emulate this, at least as far as solar energy is concerned, by turning sunlight into power. Now, if we could do photosynthesis, we could do this far more effectively. But that has been a big barrier. After all, it's a biological process that we have a lot of trouble trying to emulate. This new approach takes CO2, water, and sunlight. It then splits off the oxygen from this, creates formic acid, and the formic acid can be used as fuel. This is particularly useful when you consider that it can either be converted into hydrogen, which can be used as clean fuel, or it can be used within the system itself to generate power. The advantages of this particular design over others is that it is both more robust and more effectively able to be scaled. This means that once it's ready for industrial application, it could in theory be put into action more effectively and more cheaply. This means it's a far more desirable renewable energy source than others have been. Add to that, with movement away from fossil fuels, it could be possible to use the hydrogen being generated from this as a fuel itself, rather than the more arduous process of breaking down water. That's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions you may have below.